very happy to be here today. We are talking with Ryan Lane. Ryan is a person whom I met uh, just a few years ago when he was a student in the Master of Social Work program at the College of St. Scholastica. Ryan now has his master's in social work and is currently working as an adult and adolescent therapist for Casa de los Niños, a nonprofit in Tucson, Arizona. Before entering the social work program, Ryan served for six years as a U.S. Navy hospital corpsman in multiple countries, including in Iraq. While serving in rural Madagascar as a Peace Corps volunteer, he focused on community health and youth development as part of Michelle Obama's Let the Girls Learn Global Initiative. Ryan's passion is about working with boys and men to foster healthy relationships and masculinity. And our grand dream, and I know that his passion, uh, is to ultimately, ultimately participate in reframing our understanding and perceptions of masculinity and what it means to be a man. In his free time, Ryan loves music, practicing Aikido, songwriting, singing, and we have on occasion uh, had the, the, the gift of hearing some of Ryan's music. And I would like to say that I think of Ryan as a synthesizer of scholarship. He is intellectually fearless, deeply grounded, and a very compassionate man. So thank you so much, Ryan, for being with us. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you for the in introduction. <laughs> uh, you know, every word is heartfelt and uh, we benefit, we gain so much. Um, and are privileged and honored and about uh, with your participation in this approach to healing that we call relational cultural theory. So could you just tell us a little bit about what drew you to it? As a graduate student, you read all kinds of things. So what drew you to this particular model? Well, um, I, before joining, to, to go back a little bit, and I'll try to keep it brief, but um, I met Dr. Connie Gunderson um, when I was graduating um, from, from undergrad. I studied French and anthropology, and um, I, I just, I was trying to figure out what to do for grad school, and I, uh, I had heard that um, she had done a lot um, of work in Germany and work focusing on human trafficking. And I was, I was just curious to, to meet her and to get to know her. And so we started talking and at the time I had, it was, I had served in the military and, um, I thought I wanted to go to grad school then. And, and it, it occurred to me that I, um, I actually applied to the program and was accepted. And I, I decided that I wasn't quite ready for grad school. And I um, ended up going to Madagascar um, to serve in the Peace Corps and kind of postpone grad school for a little bit. And in Peace Corps, it's hard to put into words how amazing of an experience it was. But I think that coming back from the Peace Corps Madagascar has such a such a complex situation. It's an incredibly beautiful country. It's the biodiversity um, is is unbelievable and unique. And much of the biodiversity in Madagascar only exists in Madagascar. But it's a it's a complex relational problem in Madagascar in terms of in terms of population and environment and poverty and corruption interlaced with and and colonialism and remnants of colonialism interlaced with this incredible culture of resilience and and incredibly kind people and so uh i think that when i got when i finished my time in Madagascar and I decided to continue doing social work because I, I left really feeling confident that social work was, was what I wanted to do. 
um, I went to Scholastica and um, RCT just really, really fit with my values. Um, I think that I was seeing, I was, I was seeing things as relational problems um, in terms of whether we're talking about the way that our countries interact with each other, the way we interact with climate change, the way we interact with our environment. And RCT allowed me to put words and a theoretical framework over a lot of the things I was already thinking about. That is amazing. You have brought so much together already. And you are starting to, um, let me say, presage many of the directions that I hope that we are evolving as an RCT community. So tell me about your experience um, as a male student uh, and uh, by extension, and perhaps more important, how you see this work in uh, particularly in, with your focus on healthy male relationships, healthy perceptions of masculinity? Well, being a male student in social work, uh, it, it was, it, it was an eye-opening and a humbling experience. Uh, not always easy. I, we watched, you know, we watched a video actually, um, that, that really, really kind of struck me. I think it was in our first year. Um, and, and Connie, Connie showed us a video actually of you speaking in Germany, um, during her, uh, when, when I think, I think you, and 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 Judy went over and there was something you said and it still it still sticks with me and I'm going to paraphrase but you said something about mutuality is a place where uh, where you will be treated with dignity it is not a place where you're guaranteed to be comfortable um, and again, I'm paraphrasing, you said it more eloquently, but that's, that's what stuck with me. And I think that that really hits a lot of, of social work. It, it, I learning more about power and control. And, uh, when, when you are on kind of when you're a male on the intersectionality theoretical framework, you have to get in touch with what you don't know, and you have to get in touch with your willingness to listen to what other people have to say. Um, and sometimes that doesn't always leave you feeling like you are on the right side of, 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 of a lot of things. <laughs> so, um, but, it's, but it's also an honor to be able to learn how to listen openly and to be able to uh, look at yourself and clearly and, and, and look at your own values and, and question your own values and, and your own thoughts and your own biases. And so, yeah, it, it, was, it was challenging at times. It still is, it's, it's not, it's, I think, I think my time in social work really at Scholastica and focusing on RCT really helped me get in touch with what I don't know. <laughs> that is one of the challenges of privilege. And it's interesting you mentioned intersectionality because of all of us have a privilege of some kind. Uh, and um, it's a, a position from which you can be very, very unaware of what's going on and what are the things that you need to know. So. I know that you work with some really challenging populations. When you were a student, I believe you were working with men uh, who had been involved or who were perpetrators of uh, domestic violence. And I want to know just how, how did RCT sort of work in that situation? When was it most alive for you, most challenging? What can you help us understand? Yeah, um, so I, I 
did an internship and, and I was actually working um, for them for a while for, for an organization called um, called DAIP, the Domestic Abuse Intervention Program. So um, they developed actually in the 1980s something called the Duluth Model, which is um, a nationally and internationally recognized approach to to trying to address domestic violence. Um, and so, my, and they, they developed something called the power and control wheel and the equality wheel, which um, I know Coving, uh, Stephanie Covington has, has used it in some of her, her work with addiction and her group's work. We, we focused on it at least, but um, what I was doing was I was working as a men's nonviolence um, group facilitator. And so, so what these groups consisted of is men who had been court mandated to attend groups at DAIP uh, for, for domestic violence and for being, for being charged with domestic, domestic violence. So that was, I think, RCT really, really helped me a lot with those groups. It's, it's easy to stand in that space and, um, and to want to judge, to, to want to, to, to throw, to, to tell people about their privilege, which, which is important. It's important to understand it, but, um, I think, again, we, we focused in, in our groups on, on, the, on power and control mainly. And we would, we would go between power and control. Um, and there's, there's a number of different aspects of power and control that were developed in this curriculum and equality. And so what, what does power and control look like, whether it's using violence, verbal violence, uh, entitlement and privilege, um, uh, threatening behavior, using children, um, being the king of the castle, um, various, various trends, and looking at equality and what, what direction might we want to go? What is the impact of power and control? How does that actually cause relational isolation in yourself and in your family and in your children? how does moving your belief systems and your actions to to one of equality and and mutuality um what does that look like and how do we how do we move forward and and i think that that for me um neil degrassi tyson has has a has a phrase that says um we, it's not enough to be right. You also need to be effective. And so during my time, I think that that's something um, that I really took away from, from my experiences was that it's, it's easy to judge certain behaviors. And obviously we objective, there are behaviors that we objectively need we don't we don't want them they they are corrosive um but the place to move some but to to explore belief systems and to be able to look at these things it's it's kind of the the whole hand brain model i need all the brains to be online and so how how am i reflecting my own my own care how, how am i how am i projecting care so that people can hear me and that i'm coming from a place of sincerity um and that i'm not just shaming people into into just going into white fragility or defensive mode or, or whatever how do we keep people online so that they can really explore themselves and i think that that in the process of doing that I also was able to explore myself and my own my own anger and and my own areas of power and control and and 
And I, I, and I think that the process, the process of connecting um, has at least helped me think about my own actions and intents and in ways that I hadn't before and, and to listen and to, to see people as a collective integral whole, as opposed to just the pieces, these, these various pieces of things that they've done. That was long winded, but did that no, make sense? That's incredibly powerful. And I was thinking, uh, Jean Baker Miller often said that we know we're in healthy relationships when everyone has an opportunity to grow. So clearly you were there with a firm set of principles, convictions, and uh, expertise. And at the same time, uh, you allowed yourself to be open to the influence of the people uh, who you were there to help and whose behavior you were, you know, there to help them change. So right. that's, yeah, that seems to me a wonderful example of what we like to call power with um, oh, exactly. instead of power over. So thank you so much for sharing that and your current work. Tell oh, me how you know, tell me about that. You seem to have changed geographies. Yes, a, a, a bit. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, I was I so I was actually working with um, one one more thing that I do want to say about my time with DAIP because after I graduated, I was I I, I stayed on and I was working with them. Um, our groups. It was, it was kind of an amazing time because of, um, because of the pandemic, our groups shut down. Um, and so there became a really big question of, we know, we know that domestic violence rates are going up. Um, what do we do? We can't do groups anymore. Um, and so, and one thing I was moved by with this and I'll move, I'll move on, but I just, I think it's just fascinating that that there, there were all kinds of conferences that were happening and telephone conferences of, of various groups um, that were focusing on domestic violence around the world that were trying to come together. Uh, DAIP was talking to, to, to it, people in Italy and, and in Britain, like people were collectively coming together to figure out how do, what do we do? And so in Duluth, we started doing individual phone calls to again stay in connection and and to go through to kind of go through the our our wheels and our curriculum in the same way to have some sort of connection to if check in with it with these guys um and to be able to check in with their partners so um so so that was that was that was really it was a really amazing time and a really amazing experience for me. Um, and moving on from, from that, I, yes, I just took a job as a therapist in Tucson, Arizona. So I recently went through, um, through a training, um, through for, for integrative mind body skills, um, which is through the, the center for mind body connection and, and so I've been thinking about that a lot lately. Um, and I, I, have, I have a friend who's a psychiatrist in, in Tucson and they recommended this organization. And it's an organization, to, Casa de los Niños is an organization that is focusing on the family as a whole. So, so again, a relational model that is, um, that is looking at how to be able to to work with families so that when possible, they can be kept together um, when it is safe. And how do we work, work with parents and kids to be and be in connection with them to be able to, um, if there are problems, especially with at-risk families, how do we, how do we work with them? So I've been working mostly with men and with boys um, who have been struggling with anger um, because of my background with DAIP now. And it's, um, and it's, it's definitely different working as a therapist. I'm still, I'm still learning. Um, we all are, by the way. Yes, yes <laughs> we all are. Um, it's, it's been really, I've really liked it so far though. Um, again, I, I think even more as a therapist, I've been learning that, um, 
that I have to, the, the more I'm in touch with what, with what I don't know, the better I'm able to, um, to, as St. Francis said, seek to understand and not to be understood. And so really, really trying to hear where people are coming from and understand the situations of which they go through um, so that we can look at their belief systems and we can look at their demographics. And I think RCT, again, whether I'm talking about mind body skills, I'm thinking about the relationship with, with the mind and the body. Like, like I think RCT is, is a framework that informs the way that I look at myself and everything that I do, even if I'm not directly always inherently practicing what would, what would be called RCT, the way that I'm thinking about the things that I am practicing is RCT. When I'm meeting with a client, I'm thinking about care. I'm thinking about, about calm, acceptedness, and my resonance, and my own, the way that I project myself. I'm thinking about, um, about I, I, read, I read a piece by Jean Baker Miller that was talking about um, how as a therapist, because of the position of power that I am inevitably in, it is my responsibility to really try to, to, to develop an environment that where a growth fostering relationship is possible. And, and so I, I do my best to do that. Um, and, and to do that in an, uh, in authentic way, I think is, it's hard, <laughs> but, but, but I, but I, but I like it a lot. And it's really, I, one thing that I've learned, especially doing individual sessions is people are just absolutely profoundly interesting when you are willing to listen to them. And I don't think, I think I was an okay listener, but I, I think that the process of social work and, and RCT has, has led me to be a little bit more of a listener. Um, obviously I'm talking a lot right now, but, 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 but I, um, but yeah, I think that the ability to listen and it seems that I don't know why this is, but it seems that when people are able to explain who they are to me, and I imagine it's not just me, I think, but I'm, I'm the one that's there when it's happening. It seems to help them be able to understand themselves better. Um, and, 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 and I grow as well, so. Now you are describing perfectly what uh, Irene Stiver talked about when she talked about authenticity and the more of yourself that you're able to bring into the room, including the uncertainty, including the awareness of what you don't know and openness to knowing more, make space for other people to come in as well. So that, thank you so much for that. I want to go and um, just ask you about futures. You know, how do you, how do you see this work evolving in the future and the role that you want to play in this? I mean, you're already doing amazing work. So how do you see us, this, our community, growing, expanding, and moving in the future? Well, um, I know that part of what it is going to be is staying in connection um, with each other. I, um, I know that that's a fundamental piece. I don't know exactly what directions. I'm, I know that for the next couple of years, I want to focus on, on therapy um, and, and getting, getting my independent clinical license. Um, I personally have, I, I, I'm really interested in how to develop um, RCT into um, something that is, that, that is more ex accessible to, to men. And, um, and again, getting in touch and, 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 in authentic connection with what I don't know. I'm not exactly sure what that looks like yet. I do know that it's important. Um, 
I'm also really interested in being able to continue doing some work in Madagascar. So, so um, I've there there's there's a project that I a, a, a dream project that I've been thinking about for a long time that has to do that would have to do with youth development in the village that I was living in and trying to um, collect collect stories um, from 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 village elders and trying to help youth develop more of a framework of understanding and appreciation of the relationship with their own environment. Um, so that's, I think that 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 is is a piece that I'm just personally interested in. Um, it's incredibly exciting to hear you talk about it. Yeah, um, it. I I started I started it a I started it and I kind of ran out of out of time while I was in Peace Corps, um, but it's something I've thought about even as possibly like a Fulbright scholarship, or conceivably a PhD program. Um, I'm, I, I don't, I don't know. Um, school's pretty hard for me, <laughs> which is, which the hard things are good things. Um, but, but I, I do really, I, there's something I appreciate about really doing the work. There's something I'm at least at this moment appreciating about doing therapy versus being in school. Um, and, and really, I, I just feel like I'm learning so much, but, um, but yeah, I, I definitely Madagascar is, is high on my list of things that I'm thinking about. And I, I do imagine a framework for myself where I'm at least spending part of the time doing work in Madagascar. Um, and being able to continue working on on the issues in in my in my own country and 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 not just issues but just working with people and helping them be able to discover themselves as as is what I'm working on in myself. <laughs> yes, yes. We cannot end this interview without talking about your music uh, because I remember as uh, and of course I remember as uh, one of your projects while you were a master's student, you wrote a beautiful song, Love Transcends Me Back to You. Yeah. I love that line. And I just want you to say a few words about uh, the role of the arts in your life and how that is a part of the work you do as a citizen of the world who is committed to healing. Yeah, I think that music music has just been really, really important to me. Uh, it's it's something that I do. It's it's a I I I've always liked songwriting. I've always been kind of driven by lyrics. Again, seeking to understand, not to be understood. Um, I like hearing what people have to say. So. Um, so Leonard Cohen, Chris Christopherson, Joan Baez, there's uh, Kate Wolf, there's a number of people that I grew up listening to, mostly because of my mom. Um, uh, I have a really good mom, um, but- uh, I think we can tell. Yeah, <laughs> but, uh, but I think that for me, music is something that allows me a place to be able I don't know, somehow when I write a song and I liked, I generally like to write songs about other people or other things, but it helps, it helps me to be able to understand them. Muse, songwriting has helped me to be able to be courageous at times. Um, I don't think of myself as a very courageous person, but I know that I can, I, I seem to get really good songs out of facing challenges. And yeah. so, I mean, even Iraq, like I was, I, w I didn't know what that was going to be like deploying to Iraq or joining the military, but I knew that there were good songwriters that, that had joined the military in the past, like Johnny Cash and Chris Christopherson and John Prine and a number of others. And so I, I get, I get inspiration through other people people and through experiences and through the things that I, I see and, and, 
and it allows me to look at those things from a place of of um i don't have I don't always have to be nice in my songs. I can, I can actually be angry. I can, um, I don't have to be an agreeable. Um, you have, you have a term in your book, disruptive empathy. And I think that, I think that my songwriting is a place where I can be disruptively empathetic, um, or disruptively compassionate. And, and it, it's something that, that I feel like I need at times. Um, I, I generally try to be nice and get along with people uh, or be kind and get along with people. But I, my songwriting is a place where I can um, let, let some of those other parts of me be, ex be explored in, in ways that are artistic and meaningful. It sounds very much to me like a, um, a profound integration you were speaking earlier about you know the mind body spirit uh all parts of ourselves bringing them forward um in service of healing yeah what are the things you say uh, uh i mean you have shared so much with us uh you said in your bio that you just want to be a decent global citizen and ryan I have such a deep appreciation for that. I think we will all listen and learn with you and fully appreciate and know that we are privileged that we have such a decent global citizen in our community. So thank you so much for spending this time and sharing with us. Thank, thank, thank you, Maureen. And, uh... Thank you to, I mean, it's, I, I am who I am largely in part because of the relationships that I've had and the people who have come across, who, who, whose paths I've come across. And that's, that's Connie Gunderson. That's, that's having a, a great mom. That's, 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 that's having your books and your writings and, and, um, and Amy Banks and Judy Jordan, and I'm just really grateful to be a part of this community. Thank you.